great to see everybody here. Um, it's nice to be able to get to see old friends and colleagues again. against us, it also burns the grass in my yard. Cool. Um, so, <clears throat> good morning. Um, my little bit's going to be a little bit dry, uh, I'm afraid, because we've got to the point now where the legislation in great part is defined. And if any of you have had a chance to have a look at what's planned, there's a lot of documentation there. There's the bill, there's for guidance notes, there's the impact assessment. And to be honest with you, somebody who's lived and breathed this for four years, it took me a long time to wade through and kind of pull out the useful bits. So I thought that's what I would do for you today. Um, but before I do that, <coughs> let's bear with me. I uh, get a bit emotional um, sometimes about this because um, it's been a hell of a journey. Um, and uh, Fegan, um, I've, I've worked with her now, <clears throat> I think it's probably about the 40th time I've worked with her. And um, she never fails to have an impact on me, um, as you can see at the moment. It will pass in a minute, it always does. Uh, but she's become a friend <clears throat> above everything. And I think today, unfortunately, because she's got to be somewhere else, she's probably really sold her journey quite short. And I just want to spend a couple of minutes to sharing that with you, if I may, um, and just to put some context around who she is and what she's achieved. She's a mum, you know? She was a counsellor. She had a, a, a nice little counselling practice um, before uh, that awful night. And if you've never heard her speak in full before, I really encourage you to go and sort of find places where she's speaking. It is, um, <clears throat> it, it's a profoundly uh, impactive story. Uh, one that, um, as I say, I, I, I know it intimately. I've heard it millions of times before, and I didn't even hear it today, and, and you can see the sort of impact it has on me. Um, it's life-changing. Uh, it's been life-changing for her and her family. Um, it's been, obviously, a, a very, very negative experience, which she hides very well sometimes. And we're four days away from the anniversary of her child being murdered, and she's up here talking to people. And I think that says it all, really, about the veneer that she can put around herself, even though underneath, I can tell you now, it, it's, it's turmoil sometimes. Um, but what she saw after Martin died was an industry that really needed to do a lot better. And um, I will never forget the day she came to see me. I was the national coordinator for counterterrorism uh, at, at Scotland Yard uh, for Protect and Prepare. And it was uh, Valentine's Day on, uh, in 2019, and my boss had said, would you have this meeting with this woman whose son was murdered at Manchester? And by that time, I, I had a real sense of what had gone wrong. We'd obviously done all the sort of post-event debriefs. We knew where we'd failed. And I'll be honest with you, I really did not want that meeting. You know, I was effectively a senior representative of the state, and this woman whose son had been murdered in some part through our negligence, um, I thought she's going to come in here and she's going to tear me a new one, you know. And I thought she's got a right to do that, but I don't really want to be the recipient of it. Um, but I took the meeting because I'm a good soldier. And um, I met that woman who has um, become a, a, a deep and dear friend and one who, as you see, OBE. Um, she's an OBE not because of Martin's Law. She's an OBE because she spends all of her time campaigning for reconciliation and friendship and peace. I'm not sure I would be doing that if my son had been murdered, but uh, I just wanted to sort of put that out there because she's an amazing person and probably sold herself really short today. Anyway, so at that meeting, she told me about what happened at the theatre. She told me about how badly she'd been let down um, by, you know, British security. Um, and it, it was something that we knew and we'd recognised. I remember the day after the Manchester Arena bombing with my then boss at Scotland Yard sitting around the table thinking, how the hell are we going to stop this from happening again? And, and our view at that point was security has to stop being discretionary in the same way as fire safety is not discretionary. Why should we allow people to play Russian roulette with the lives of people they're responsible for? 
And so I, I agreed to meet her uh, in a few months' time when I was going to retire because the Home Office had already told us we weren't to go on about it anymore. We, they got really fed up with us. Uh, and then the rest is fairly well-documented public history. Um, Brendan Cox came on board. He's the husband of the murdered MP, Joe Cox. He's a phenomenal um, political strategist. He really is, and a thumpingly nice bloke. Um, and, and as Fegan said, you know, she brings the power, the incredible power of, of the narrative of a grieving mother. Brendan brings the most amazing door-opening skills around government. I mean, just breathtaking, the people we've sat in front of. Uh, and I just view myself as the great head technocrat that can pull a few technical words together and try and make a bit of a proposal for a law. So, I just want to get that out of there, tell the story. This is what Martin's Law is all about. This is the dry bit, I'm afraid. Um, so I'm just going to talk about why <coughs> Martin's Law, if you can touch on it, I'll touch on it very briefly. Who's going to be affected by it? And certainly what you described to me just now, I think at some point elements of your building may well become uh, um, required to uh, comply with it. And I dare say the same will be uh, across the, uh, the room. What those companies will be required to do and um, how can I help you? And, I, you know, I've run my company as a not-for-profit over the last four years. It would have been completely inappropriate to earn a penny, um, you know, having standing on stage with Fegan one day and doing consulting around this for the next would just be completely inappropriate. So Risto Resolution is a not-for-profit company. Um, all of our money, I don't even take a salary, all of our the, the revenues we've generated over the last four years have, have gone to charity. Um, but going forward, now that the Protect Use is public domain information, I'm competing on the same playing field as anybody else. So, uh, you know, if anybody wants to pay me to do something, you can. Um, so, why? In short, the world changed in 2014. Um, we got really good at stopping people from travelling to Syria and joining the Islamic State and becoming militarised. We became really quite effective at that. We became quite effective at stopping them from coming back. And so um, uh, uh, an Islamic State spokesperson, one of their leadership group, uh, a, a man, al Nani was his name, um, he put out a call basically to everybody around the world and said, look, don't come. You can't get here. Don't come and join the fight. Stay where you are at home. Stay at home. Take the fight to the infidel at home. Pick up a knife, pick up a rock, drive a car, do it anything you can, and attack people at home. And in that statement, he successfully mobilised the terrorist community that lives inside our society. And from that period onwards, 2014, 2015, 2016, we saw this rolling wave of terrorism come across Europe and finally land on our shores in 2017. And, and that, as I say, is well-documented history. And although we haven't seen a wave of successful attacks since 2017, we see continuous ongoing attack planning with something in the region of 800 active investigations by the security services and the police in play as I speak today. So it hasn't gone away. Um, we have the most amazing security and intelligence functions in this country, but they will fail. As Fegan said, people sit at home, they radicalise themselves in their bedrooms, on the internet, talking to each other in chat groups. And the radicalisation process we have seen compress significantly. You know, in the past it would have been months, weeks at the most, at the least rather. We're seeing it in days. Um, the, the shortest case I've been aware of from the point of somebody not having previously expressed any perverse views at all to the point at which they've actively sought to commit an attack is five days. And now intelligence services haven't got a hope in hell's chance of intercepting that. So, without going through this list in great detail, um, not least of all, it's not even showing up very well on there. Um, bottom line is, we've got to change. So, we've changed in several ways already. You know, prevent. We've sought to try and stop the radicalisation in its roots. We have invested millions of pounds, probably billions of pounds, in our policing and intelligence services, but what we haven't done is invested anywhere near the same amount in protective security. And what Martin's Law will do is it will put that compulsion on us as a community. It will mobilise us in the same way as Adnani mobilised the terrorist community. It will mobilise us to respond and, and protect ourselves and the people that we are responsible for, our customers. So, the bill was published about two weeks ago. And there are, as with all bills, some definitions that it's worth knowing about. So the first thing I talk about is qualifying public premises and um, qualifying activity. I'm not going to go through this list. You can read it yourselves. Um, 
But in essence, it is anywhere that the public, and the word public is the key to all of this. So we are not going to start imposing protect duty on a trading floor over at Canary Wharf or at, you know, whoever is occupying 22 Bishop's Gate. But in those areas that you open up to the public, if the capacity is on the right level, then absolutely that then comes into play. We'll talk about capacities in a moment. But this is more than we asked for, and, and we're enormously grateful to the Home Office and government for pursuing you know, our vision in the way that they have. What, um, what I want to cover in a moment is, although we have a list of a number of areas there, like aerodromes, um, railway stations, uh, and education, there are some exemptions, and I'll talk about that in a minute, because fundamentally one of them is if there's existing statutory requirements around protecting places, as there are at airports and there are uh, on the rail network, then that isn't in play for Martin's Law. The existing regulations will um, have primacy. So we talk about premises, where that activity takes place. Of course, as we all know, we are a country that loves a good event, and it's absolutely appropriate that we look after events as well. Now, the, the, the qualifiers for events are that it's taking place at somewhere that isn't already a qualifying premises. That makes sense to me. Um, has to be accessible to the public or a section of the public for the purpose of attending that event. All right. And the access has to be by express permission only, um, <coughs> on payment or otherwise. Now, why have I highlighted that? There's one gaping hole in this legislation. And the gaping hole is outdoor events that are open to the public at large. So I can think of some such as big carnivals, um, Christmas markets, these are all public events that we actually know, sadly from history, terrorists have become incredibly attracted to because crowds get there and crowds are what terrorists nowadays want to attack. Um, so where there is a weakness in the law at the moment that we're actively working on with government to try and close, and all contributions are most welcome if anybody has brilliant ideas, um, is around this. So. Great that, we're, great that we are covering premises, great that we're covering events. Weakness, we're not covering all events. And what this really means is, if you're having a public open, door, open space event, if it hasn't got a boundary around it, or some way of exercising control over who comes through it, then it's not going to be in play. And when we think about um, Berlin Christmas Market, uh, when we think about well, I can't remember, was Strasbourg, was it? I think uh, Christmas Market. Uh, when we think about uh, the attack on the just after the Dutch royal family had gone through a uh, procession in, in the Netherlands. When we think about um, the awful um, Bastille Day attack in Nice, these were all open, unboundaried events. Um, it, and, you know, just those four I've listed there have resulted in, you know, about 100 people dying and hundreds more being brutally injured. So, um, I'm kind of labouring a little bit because, as Fegan said, last night we met with the chair of the Home Affairs Select Committee, who was the most gracious woman uh, she really was, and invited us to try and work with the committee to try and create a way of resolving this. I just want to get the message out there that Martin's Law is not a done deal, okay? If anybody, some of you I know have followed what we're doing, what we're trying to achieve, and, and we're incredibly proud to have got it this far, but Martin's Law is not a done deal, okay? It's not in the statute books. It hasn't been through Parliament yet. The Home Affairs Select Committee will find weaknesses in it. They will send it back to the Home Office. And the big fear is it won't come back out because those weaknesses are too great to resolve. So my ask of all of you is if you advocate to your own MPs or anybody, if you have trade associations and you feel willing to write an email, a note, a letter, a tweet uh, to people like the Home Affairs Select Committee, your own MP, Tom Tugendhat, the Security Minister, Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, Suala Bravan and the Home Secretary. They do get this stuff. They do get it. I mean, sometimes it feels like you're tweeting into a void, but they do get it. There are people in the Home Office who gather this stuff and they present it to the ministers and say, this is what public opinion says. So I'd encourage you, if you want to be on this journey with us, please, please do. I've laboured that enough. So, <clears throat> um, what uh, the Home Office recognised was that 
Martin's Law could be quite impactive on businesses. Um, and I'll maybe spill a bit of detail around that in a moment because I'm not necessarily I'm sure I'm in the same place. But one of the uh, features that goes alongside the bill is an impact assessment. And the impact assessment is drafted by ostensibly the Treasury and um, the uh, Business Department, Bayes. Um, and it's flagged as red because what they're saying is the cost to SMEs will be £2,000, the cost to, sorry, beg your pardon, the cost to standard tier premises, we'll talk about that in a moment, will be £2,000, and the, and the cost to enhanced tier on average will be £80,000. And of course, in times of economic strife, um, that sort of figure is going to get the, set the hairs running. Our vision for Martin's Law was always that it would be low or no cost. And <clears throat> to try and facilitate that, the government have come up with this idea of two tiers. So a standard tier applies to any premises of 100 up to 799. And they will just have to do relatively light touch um, stuff. Now, when they talk about that costing £2,000, what they're not really talking about is cash over the counter. What they're really talking about is opportunity time. Um, because... Part of what standard tier requires is a bit of awareness and learning among staff. And of course, if you take somebody off their duties for 45 minutes and sit them in front of a laptop, then clearly that is a quantifiable cost. Book your tickets now for the 8th International Tall Building High Rise Fire Safety Conference, taking place alongside FDIC in Indianapolis, US, on the 15th to the 17th of April 2024. Three days of world-class speaker presentations, debates and networking. Book your tickets via the website www.tallbuildingfiresafety.com. Early bird discount tickets will be available. The Tall and High Rise Building Fire Safety Management course is ideal for anyone who has responsibility for fire safety management in tall and high rise buildings. It is a five day intensive course with world class instructors. You can get full details of the course on our website www.tallbuildingfiresafety.com But I always like to think it's not real money unless that person is constantly generating income in which case you're right it is. Um, and then the enhanced tier will apply to those premises or events uh, at a capacity of 800 above. Now, given this is a sort of firefighter-based uh, event, you'll know way more about this than I. Currently, the bill does not define how capacity is, is defined, but it is likely to be defined on the same way as fire capacity is defined in terms of square footage and the number of people you can physically get into a, a place. So it's not necessarily going to be there's only 50 seats in that building, it's not necessarily going to be, oh, but hang on, we only ever get 25 people in here at a time. It's going to be what that footage calculation looks like, and that will define what tier you go into. I think that's the right way to do it, because otherwise we'll end up with people, um, you know, with 150 seats in their restaurant, only putting out 99 seats and claiming that it shouldn't apply to them. Um, so I think that's the right way. I mentioned just now there are some exemptions. Um, <coughs> And the key one really is around uh, faith. So um, I've been really impressed with how powerful the faith lobby was when they did the consultation. I don't have any problem with it, uh, but they rightly said, look, you know, nobody comes to church anymore, but these churches have all got a capacity of hundreds. Um, we definitely don't have the money to uh, comply with any of this, and we don't have, in most faith areas, we don't have the, uh, the administrative backup to get people trained to promote awareness and all that sort of stuff and so the government listened and they said yep yeah, okay so all faith establishments will just sit in the standard tier regardless of their capacity except those few that make money out of being an iconic place like Westminster Abbey they will be in whatever tier their capacity sits them in if it's, if it's over 800 they will be um, in the enhanced tier and in a moment I'll talk about what they'll have to do um, that all seems pretty fair to me, to be honest with you. Uh, I don't have any complaints around that. 
And then um, the government has defined this idea of uh, person responsible. Right? And that's not a typo, it is in the bill as person responsible as opposed to responsible person. I've got no idea why <laughs> when you write a law you have to write everything backwards. Um, but this is a little bit like health and safety. I'm going to guess it's probably a bit like fire eggs. I don't really know anything about fire eggs, but there is somebody who carries the can if, if you don't comply. Um, but that somebody can be a corporate body. Uh, and of course, we've seen that in, in health and safety prosecutions in the past. I mean, I, I, I spent a fair bit of time in the Met Police, and I remember after we shot Jean Charles the Menethis, uh, you know, the Met Police was prosecuted uh, for a health and safety breach. Um, so, um, the person responsible um, is, is defined there. Um, clearly, that person who is responsible for perhaps a big stadium or you know, 22 Bishop's Gate, they can't necessarily be into the detail day in, day out. And of course, like fire safety and health and safety, it's actually the detail that gets you into trouble. And so um, the Home Office have come up with this uh, concept of the designated senior officer. I don't know if that's a fire thing or a health and safety thing. Um, but what they're basically saying is that the person responsible can delegate responsibility for making sure this stuff happens to a designated senior officer. That makes a lot of sense to me, uh, personally, uh, because, you know, in a lot of places, you won't have a director of security. You might have a director of facilities management. You might have a director of health and safety. You might have a director of safety and security. Uh, and I've seen those sorts of jobs where actually the security element, the, the poor individual holding that um, remit has absolutely no security experience whatsoever, any qualifications. And of course, bringing in the idea of a designated senior officer is the opportunity to get the right person managing that portfolio on your behalf. Um, but clearly, uh, the person responsible can't abdicate the responsibility, um, and they have to make sure that that person is the right person, um, and they have to make sure um, that if the person responsible is a corporate body, they don't completely um, delegate their responsibilities and try and shift it off the company altogether, it has to stay, the DSO has to stay with a director inside the company. Um, I have a non-executive directorship with a fairly big security company and it's quite interesting to see the sort of contracts that are written between client and, um, and contractor. Um, that There is inside contracts quite a lot of displacement. I don't think it's intentional, it's just you know, the way contracts are written sometimes can be a bit sloppy. There's quite a lot of displacement of, of responsibility. Um, and that just can't happen in the future. Somebody's got to hold the can. Somebody's got to make sure the stuff is done properly. So now we've kind of got all those definitions out of the way, what are we actually going to ask people to do? So going back to a standard tier um, premises, um, we're going to ask that relevant workers must be provided with terrorism protection training. So relevant worker is not defined in the bill at the moment. It will be, I'm sure. But effectively, it's the public-facing workers. It's the people who have got to take responsibility for keeping your customers safe. It's not the back office staff. It's not the accountant on floor three. It's the security officer at the front door. It's the uh, customer service assistant inside um, the restaurant or the retail outlet. It's those people who when the fire alarm goes off, other people will say, right, out that way. It's the same. When a bad incident happens, those people got to step up and protect the public. So they're the relevant workers, standard tier, just a bit of training. The bill doesn't specify what the training is at the moment. It says that the regulator, which we'll is what regulation at the moment, will define what that training needs to be from time to time. But the starting point for that at the moment is probably going to be the ACT Awareness e-learning course that's freely available, 45 minutes from uh, the National Counterterrorism Security Office. Uh, as the entry point for understanding terrorism, it's a great piece of work. Uh, it's five, six years old now, probably needs a bit of refreshing, um, but it's still a great piece of work. And, and we're lucky in this country to have some of the infrastructure that we do that generates that sort of stuff. Um, Russ, I've got no idea what the time is or how long I'm supposed to speak for. You just tell me to shut up if I start going over, right? I'm sorry. Um, and then the next thing, once I've had that train, not once I've had, but you know, as part of their requirement, is this idea of a standard tier evaluation. Now, 
you see the word evaluation rather than the word assessment. Uh, that's, it's a nuance, but it's quite an important nuance. So the evaluation will just require the premises to have an understanding of how exposed they might be to various attack methodologies. And that's why the starting point for this needs to be the, the training and, and, and the awareness. And of course, once you understand what your exposure to those methodologies are, you can start thinking about what your plan needs to be. Now, the difference between a standard tier and an enhanced tier is in the standard tier, you're just expected to understand what the methodology is and know what you'll do if you're confronted with it. The enhanced tier is effectively a step in the middle, which says, understand what your exposure to the methodology is, bloody well do something about it, and then if the bad guys still get through that, know what you're going to do about it. Um, so the standard tier is just really about understanding how exposed you are and what you need to do about it. And the rest here is quite quite common sense really which is you know when, when things change have a look at the plan again refresh it have a look at what you understand to be you know the terror situation in the UK um, even now you know five six years after 2017 when we saw threat levels go up to critical at one point and the message I was giving out to people at that point was you know are you doing the same today as you were doing yesterday and very commonly the answer was yes you know, what this very clearly says now in law is, look, here's your plan for today when we're at substantial, meaning an attack is likely. Should that plan look the same when we go to critical and attack is imminent? Of course it shouldn't, unless, you know, you're operating as a citadel 24 hours a day already, and none of us really want to live in that environment. So this is a sensible piece of legislation that, that says, let's be proportionate about this. Let's see your plan. You refresh it regularly as the situation changes. Uh, so the enhanced tier, as I mentioned just now, really it's the same, but there's a step in the middle, which instead of evaluation, required to have a terrorism risk assessment. And so that's looking at those methodologies, you know, fire, vehicles, knives, guns, bombs, chemicals, and it's saying which one of those can harm me, and if they can harm me, what would the consequence of that be? Is one person going to die? Is 10 people going to die? 100 people going to die? And I'm not going to give you a lesson about risk today. Uh, I'm sure I don't even need to do that. All I will say, though, is terrorism risk and fire risk and health and safety risk are not the same thing. They are not quantified in the same way. So terrorism risk, you do not put a likelihood component in it because terrorism is completely unpredictable. We have no idea where it's going to come from, in what form, against whom, when, where, how, sometimes even why. The only likelihood assessment you can take on terrorism is that given to you by the Joint Terrorism Analysis Centre that sets for national threat levels, which today says an attack is likely. But we don't know where. If we did, promise you, we'd tell you. So <clears throat> what we need to get in the habit of is accepting that that's the case and preparing ourselves accordingly. Those of you who have followed uh, the Manchester Arena uh, inquiry, uh, you know, oh, I could go on about that one forever, um, but we should be really proud of that inquiry and the fact that our nation can drill into something so catastrophic and lay bare all the failings of every single element of what shouldn't have failed on that night and can sit there and say, this is what we need to do this is what went wrong. It's a phenomenal piece of work. But one of the key pieces there was this disconnected understanding of risk. And we had the event risk assessment, or the location risk assessment, I think said low. And the national threat level at that time was severe, meaning an attack is highly likely. And let's be honest, we'd seen one eight weeks before on Westminster Bridge. We'd seen a wave of terrorism coming across Europe. We'd seen the Stade de France attacked in about two years previously. And so <coughs> what was happening was people were applying their own concept of what likelihood looked like. And the net result is, let's be honest, you're almost certainly right. It probably isn't going to happen to you. You know what? It probably isn't going to happen to you. But that's still a game of Russian roulette. You know, I spin that chamber, only one in six of those times is going to be a bullet in it, it's going to hurt me. Five out of six times are going to get away with it. But that woman there, you know, 
Her family didn't get away with it. Other families didn't get away with it. Not just there, but elsewhere. So that's why we've got to get in this idea of believing what we're told by the intelligence services, taking out our own interpretation of likelihood and just going with, can it hurt us? If it can, how? What are we going to do about it? See, I get excited about this stuff. <clears throat> and then the important thing is, if you know what the problem is and what our exposure to that risk is, what are we going to do about it? All right? Now, this is the bit that gets the, the, you know, the horses scared. It's because everybody's sort of immediate reaction will be, oh, my God, you want me to put a million pounds worth of past 68 rated bollards around my premises? No, we don't. No, we don't. I would, I would stand in the court and fight on your behalf if that wasn't appropriate. It might be appropriate, but it might not be. Because there are so many different ways to mitigate both your vulnerability to terrorism, but also the consequence. And if you can bring either of those things down, you're reducing your overall risk profile. So I think the great challenge of Martin's Law <coughs> will be around people being able to articulate why they're doing things and more importantly, why they are not doing things. But I want to really get the message across to you now is that Martin's Law is not about bollards, gates, locks, barriers. It, it really isn't. Most of the time, it's going to be about process. It's going to be about awareness. It's going to be about raising people's professional interest in keeping each other safe. Keeping your bloody eyes open, you know, that's a, that's a great start in a lot of places. I, I know it's also an enormous challenge because when you pay somebody £10.50 an hour, would I be on my A game for £10.50 an hour? Possibly not. Possibly not. We, and we need to, one of the wonderful things that's come out of this campaign is the security industry is starting to talk to each other about improving the lot of the people who work in it and showing a lot more respect to the people who drag their ass out of bed at six o'clock in the morning and go and stand on a gate somewhere or a post for minimum wage in all weathers. And we all need to respect them a lot more than we probably do. Sorry, I'm bound. That was a bit of a soapbox moment there. Um, <clears throat> so, <coughs> regulation. I'm not going to go a lot into regulation. The reason being that the bill defines a whole load of penalties, but currently we're really not sure how the regulator or what the regulator is going to look like. What we do know is the regulator is going to have power to in issue incredible penalties. So for offences in the enhanced tier, they're looking at that top bracket of penalty in the same way as you have the health and safety executive, which is I think, 18 million pounds or 5% of global turnover, whichever is the greater. I love those phrases, whichever is the greater. So, you know, if you are a global entertainment empire uh, and you're taking chance with people's safety and security, then by jingo, that's a big old fine. Um, but actually, more importantly, Although they've got all these, uh, you, you know, important powers to give this law teeth, the ethos of Martin's law and the ethos of the regulator will be improvement. It will be supportive, encouraging improvement. That's what we want. That's all we've ever wanted, quite frankly. Um, it will be, one hopes, the issue of improvement notices. It will be provision of guidance to be better. Um, and I think... You know, if, if we can get the Home Office to build the regulator with that mindset from day one, then this will be an incredibly powerful piece of legislation that will people will want to do the right thing because it is the right thing. Um, they just need a bit more encouragement. So next steps. Um, as Fegan mentioned last night, we met with the Home Affairs Select Committee last night. They have decided already who they're going to call to give verbal evidence. Um, they are now looking for people to provide written evidence, uh, and we're helping them develop um, that. Um, I, this has been a really emotional roller coaster, um, this campaign, and there's been times when I've thought, you know what, I just want to go away and give up. It's just too bloody difficult. And then Mrs. Murray has told me to shut up, man up, and get on with it. She's like, it's like having the worst boss in the world sometimes. Um, but she's been absolutely right, and we've kind of held the course. And last night was the most wonderful meeting. Um, with, with, with the chair of Hask, uh, in, in which I just came away from that thinking, by God, this is going to happen. Um, or certainly she's going to try and make it happen for us. But ultimately, it's down to Parliament whether it happens or not. Um, so we will probably have a King's speech in sort of July time. Um, Parliament will then um, 
go into summer recess. They'll come back September, October time, then go straight into the uh, party conference season. And the reality is Parliament won't start going again properly till November. So I think we'll start seeing, um, the, and let's see, that's out of date already, so probably enter the Parliament back in November rather than September, October. That's me being the eternal optimist. Um, if it goes through unchallenged and without the requirement to go off to committees for revision work, um, we could see Royal Assent in the first quarter of next year. I, I, I have yet to predict any timeline that's held water over the last four years. So I think realistically, I'm going to predict middle of summer next year, maybe for Royal Assent. Um, but what's really important is <coughs> if you have any charlatans out there knocking on your door saying, I'm going to sell you a protect duty compliant product, or I'm going to make you protect duty compliant, tell them to stick it up their nose. Because from the point at which Royal Assent is given, the government is looking at a period of about a year to a year and a half for implementation. And what that means is the law will be in place, but nobody's going to come prosecuting you if you're not complying with it. They're going to give you that period to, to get your act together. And probably enactment and prosecutions, if necessary, start in about 2025. What I would just say about that, <coughs> excuse me, um, is that what... The Manchester Arena inquiry did, though, was highlight a whole load of things that we now can't unknow. And there is a whole raft of litigation now around those organisations responsible for those failures, including you know, the, the public sector organisations. So you can't unknow what you know. So do you know what? We don't really need Martin's Law anymore. You've got that liability already. And it's going to cost you millions if you get found out. So what I would say to everybody is Martin's Law will come in some form or other, but you've got that liability already. Do the right thing, protect your organisation, protect your people. So there are some risks around this, as I've mentioned already. So the impact assessment is not pretty. Uh, you know, we're, we're fighting a bit of a rear guard. Uh, no, we're not. We're, we're fighting an action against that bad narrative. But when you listen to people like Paul Reed, Terrorism Insurance, when you listen to the RAND Corporation, they will tell you that terrorism since 2004, I think it was, has cost this nation £47 billion. Pounds. So that's in the direct impact cost of terrorism. It's in the cost of the infrastructure that we need to suppress it. Um, but a, a, a bomb attack, Puri will tell you, will cost 10 to £20 million. Pounds. So there's quite a strong counter-narrative to the Treasury that's concerned about the impact this will have on small businesses. We will see a general election, and as Fegan said, I think the numbers were a bit wrong, actually. I think we're on our eighth security minister, our fourth home secretary, and our fourth prime minister. I mean, it's been really hard to get stuff done simply because of that. Um, I think we will see a general election. If we haven't got this on the statute books before the general election, that's a big risk for us. Um, because whatever the next government looks like might not have this as a priority, and we've effectively got to go back and start all over again. I personally don't think I've got the emotional fortitude to do that. As you can see, sometimes I still struggle four years later. Um, but listen, there's an enormous amount of goodwill behind it. Um, I've yet to meet a politician who isn't supportive of it. But of course, when small businesses start influencing backbench MPs, that picture might change. Uh, and then, you know, buyer beware. Um, please don't buy Protect Duty compliant products because there is no Protect Duty. Um, just, just be careful. And if you're looking to contract somebody to do work for you, that's absolutely fine. But just do some due diligence. You know, the ex-police officers aren't security experts. Ex-soldiers aren't security experts. They're experts at soldiering and policing. You, you need to find people. I don't consider myself a security expert. You need to find people who've got that pedigree of both experience and qualification. Um, and, and my advice to anybody would be to go and ask other people they've worked with and look at samples of what they've done previously before you start engaging services. Um, uh, but yeah, that, that's me because I've got the shits about people um, selling Protect Duty compliant products. Um, and then how can I help? That, that's the sort of services that I provide anyway, not, not necessarily um, linked to Protect Duty, but that's because what we should all be doing. Um, and that is, if anybody ever wants to hear me burble on again, please give me a call.
Um, thank you for your time. Really appreciate it and for your support. <clears throat>